On Thursday, uh, we had the trust and donations tax question that we wanted to um, look at and um, complete. Um, can everyone see my screen? We are all good. I can see. I hope everybody can. Okay, awesome. So we will start with the request. Is that a thumbs up? Yes, yeah, sorry. Okay, awesome. All right, so we will look at the required. The required asks us to uh, calculate the donations tax payable by Jabu, and that is for 12 marks. Then uh, the B says calculate the value of the paid dominium of the commercial property in respect of Jabu, that's six marks. Calculate the donations tax payable by Tandi, and that's seven marks. Calculate uh, Jabu's taxable income from um, the care trust, six marks. Calculate Tandi's taxable income from the care trust, nine marks. And then calculate uh, Tommy's taxable income from the care trust, and that's seven marks. So this is a combination of donations tax and trust. So let us see what the background information is. Firstly, they tell us that Jabu, who is 68 years old, is married to Tandi, who is 65 years old, and they are married out of community of property without the accrual system. They are both retired and have only one child, and her name is Janet. Uh, Janet is 40 years old, and she is a widow. And then they tell us they have two grandchildren from Janet, um, Tommy, who's 17 years old, who's single and at high school, Sophia, who is 19 years old, single and studying full time. Okay, so then they tell us that Jabu and Tandi funded a trust, the Care Trust, and here after CT, at the beginning of the current tax year, the following transactions were entered into by some of the members of the family during the current year of assessment. Okay, they tell us on the 1st of March, Jabu donated 50% of the user fract of on a commercial building to Janet and uh, K-Trust each. Uh, so they each got 50%, right? Uh, which Jabu would... Uh, own for the remainder of Janet's life. On the 27th of February of the previous year of assessment, an independent third party valued the commercial building at 40 million rand. Uh, the net rental income of the commercial building for the current year of assessment was 9 million rand. Okay, so, okay. Let's go to the second point that we got from the transactions. Um, can someone just mute themselves? There's feedback from your side because you're not muted. Okay. Then the second point they tell us on the 1st of March, Tandy transferred her listed share portfolio valued at 15 million Rand to the Care Trust, uh, subject to a uh, loan of 10 million rand, bearing interest at 5% per annum. Um, the total income from the listed share portfolio for the current year of assessment was 1.5 million in total. Um, this was made up of 200,000 rand in interest, uh, 400,000 rand uh, in REIT dividends, and then 900,000 Rand in SA company dividends. Okay. And then um, they go on to tell us that on the 1st of March, um, Janet donated a fixed uh, deposit of 1 million Rand to the CT, um, which she inherited from her predeceased husband, husband's estate, the fixed deposit earned um, was 60,000 Rand um, SA interest for the current year of assessment. Okay, then it's quite a lot of information. So what I want us to do, 
uh, before we, okay, let's go and look at the trustee. Then they tell us that the trustees of the CT are Jabu, Tandi, Janet, um, and the beneficiaries are Jabu, Tandi, Janet, and Tommy and Sophia. So remembering that Tommy is a minor and Sophia is, is no longer a minor, um, that's going to be important when we are answering the questions. Then um, they tell us that the CT Trust deed stipulates the following, uh, the distribution to beneficiaries and other stipulations. Um, firstly, Jabu receives 10% of the commercial property income earned. Tandi receives 5% of the commercial property income and then 10% of each of the components of the listed share portfolio. And then Janet receives 5% of the commercial property income and 10% of each of the components of the listed uh, share portfolio. And um, it tells us that Tommy receives 2% of the commercial property income. Jabu, Jabu stipulated only when Tommy reaches the age of 18 years, um, that person, that uh, Tommy will then receive that uh, 2%. Um, and then 3% of each of the components of the listed share portfolio and 5% of the fixed um, deposit. And Sophia receives 3% of the commercial property income and 4% of each of the components of the listed share portfolio. Then they tell us, assume the following amounts were retained in the CT um, after expenses and distributions were just deducted from income. Um, firstly, the commercial property, 4 million rand, and then the listed share portfolio of 600,000 rand. Um, number three, fixed deposit, um, 20,000 Rand. And then they tell us that we can assume the official rate um, is 9% for the entire year of assessment. The, the life expectancy of the trust is 50 years. So that's going to be important when we are calculating um, the donation. Yeah. So Let's go back to our required. They tell us that we need to calculate the donations tax. Guys, please mute yourselves. Um, they tell us that we need to calculate the donation tax payable by, by Jabu. So after we've read all the information, we see that Jabu only made one donation during this year, and that's the donation of the user fract of the commercial building. So how, where do we start? This is the information that we need to look at, point one. So they tell us that he donated 50% of the user fract on a commercial building to Janet and the CT each. Né? So each of them received 50% of the user fract. Um, and then the building would still be owned or uh, by Jabu during the this period or for the remainder of Janet's life. So where do we begin to calculate the donations tax payable by Jabu? Any takers? Where would where would we start? Yes, Larato. Okay, we'll start uh, by getting the fair value market uh, okay. of the yes of the commercial uh, building. And how much is that? Uh, okay. According to the information we we have, is forty million. Thank you. So it's 40 million rand. This is our fair market value. And then from there, where do we, what do we do? What do we need to determine next? And then we multiply by 12%. Why do we do that? What are we trying to um, achieve by multiplying by 12%? We calculate the annual value. Yes, 100%. Yes, 100%. And then from there, where do we go? Thank you, Narato, for starting us off. Next person, what do we do after determining the annual value? We check the life expectancy of the donor and the donee. And in this case, who is the donor and the donee? Oh, sorry. Uh, life expectancy of Jabu as the donor and life expectancy of Jeanette as the donee. Okay. You are halfway there. Um, I was going to say the same thing. Okay. So remember, oh, okay. yes, yes, 
Yeah, I'm saying we are going to choose the shorter between the two. But I think with this one, because they say uh, Jabu will own for the remainder of Jeanette's life, I think we are just going to use um, Jabu's life expectancy. Okay. 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 Are you saying that that is the specified period? I'm saying <clears throat> uh, we were going to choose the shorter of the two, okay. ne? Yes, but 100%. because. In this case, they are saying Jab will own for the remainder of Jeanette's life. Then we are mm -hmm. going to use uh, Jabu's life expectancy. But anyway, Jabu's life expectancy. No, no, you're right. Jabu's life expectancy, life expectancy is lesser. Is the lesser of the two. Um, them just telling you that he's going to own that property for the remainder of Jeanette's life. Um, it it doesn't change the fact that you're going to use the 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 shorter of the two. Okay. So you 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 and Mianka both mentioned that we would first calculate uh, the 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 factor for either Jabu or uh, Janet. So we've now decided that we're going to go to the table. Okay, so we said Jabu is, how old is Jabu again? He is 68 years old right now. So his next birthday, he will be 69. So we would use, we would go to uh, 69, not 49, sorry, 69. And then we would use the factor of the male, which is in the first column. So we would use uh, 5.591 point, uh, 5 point, uh, sorry, 5.59182 as our factor because uh, that's his age on his next birthday. Then uh, we wouldn't use Jeanette's one because Jeanette would have- Sorry, Dina. Hi, hi. I think we are using the, the wrong column. You are taking from the rent value. I think you should take from the life expectancy column, the first column after the ages. Please check the heading. Hi, Charlotte. Hi, Dinawa. Sorry hi, to hi. No, no, it's fine. So this is where we are, right? So to determine whose life expectancy we're going to use, we know that Jabu's period would be shorter, being 9.81. Then the factor that we want to use would then be from here. Is that what oh. you're saying, Charlotte? Oh, I thought we should use the 9.81. Okay. Are we using the present value? Yes, that's that's the factor that we use when we are doing our calculation. Oh, okay. Right. Yeah. So um, the first column just tells us that um, the life expectancy that is left for that person who's 69 years old is going to be 9.81. And then for Janet, because she is, how old is Janet? She is, give me two seconds, let me go back. Janet is uh, 40 years old right now. So on her next birthday, she'll be 41. So her, her life expectancy, she is a female, so we'll go to the second column and we will see that her life expectancy will be 34.57. Yeah? So we wouldn't use her factor would have been that would have been in the second column um, because her period is longer than that of Jabu's. So we will use the shorter period, which is the 9.81 from the male column because he's a male and his next birthday, he would be 69. And then we use the factor in the present value uh, of one rand per annum for life. So we use this factor. This is the factor that we're using when we're doing the calculation. Okay, 100%. So that's the first 50%. So the first 50%, they told us that we gave to Janet. Ne? So we, the, we've we determined now that the shorter of the two periods is going to be Jabu's life, ex, um, life expectancy. So we use his um, factor. And then what happens with the other 50%? Do we just ignore it or do we also determine um the 
the factor as well for that one? Oh, yes, we do. We have yes. to check the. Where did I see that? Uh, the trust. Doesn't mm -hmm. it have number of years or something? Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Yes, check the life expectancy of the trust as well. So at the life expectancy of the trust is 50 years. They were kind enough to give it to you in this one. But you know that if something, if some, if an, if it's a non, um, it's, if it's not a natural person, the life expectancy will always be 50 years unless they tell you otherwise. So in this case, we know that the life expectancy is 50 years. So now we're going to go back to our tables. Okay, so with the, with a non, uh, if it's not a natural person, we use table B. And then we also look, we do a comparison again between um, the, the thingy, the years, which will be the 50 years, and then the factor for the, um, for the trust will be 8,3045. But then again, we know that this life expectancy of 50 years is much higher than the life expectancy of the 69 year old, which is still 9,81. So we would still use Jabu's life expectancy to, to, to calculate um, um, the factor, or this is the factor that we would use again, excuse me, for the trust. We would still use um, 5.59182. Because again, Jabu's life expectancy is shorter than that of the trust. Does that make sense? So let's look at the let's look at the calculation there. I think maybe it'll also help if we look at it. So we've already determined that the value of the commercial property is 40 million Rand. And then we said that the annual value of that property would then be um it would be 4.8 million. But first, we, we must first apportion it between Janet and the trust. And then uh, Janet has 50% of the 4 million. So her, the, her annual value would then be the 2.4 million. Then we need to determine which one is the shorter um, um, period. Is it going to be Jabu's life or is it going to be Janet's life? So we've decided that um, uh, Jabu's life expectancy is the shorter one. So we would use... Jabu's life expectancy, and we would use his factor being the 5.59182. And then we would then multiply, we would then take that and we would capitalize our, um, our annual value with that. And that would give us the 30,420,368 Rand, right? Then for the trust, we do the same thing. We take 50% of the 4.8 million and it would give us the annual value of 2.4 for the, for the trust. Again, we know that the life expectancy of Jabu is going to be the shorter one between um, the trust and, Jabu's, um, and Jabu. So we would use the factor from the uh, table A, which will be 5.59182. Because his one is shorter, um, and then we would multiply it again by the two point four million. Uh, then we would get thirteen point uh, thirteen million four hundred and twenty thousand three hundred and sixty eight rand. So the total uh, value of the donation would be um, the the thirteen million plus the other thirteen million, and that gives us twenty six million eight hundred and forty one thousand two hundred and seventy six. Then we would list the general exemption that would be available to him. And then from there, we would get the taxable donation for the year of 26,741,276. So the donations tax that will be payable is 20% of that amount. And that gives us 5,348,255. Is everybody comfortable with this one? Can we move on? Then they tell us that we need to go and calculate the bare dominium of the commercial property in respect of Jabu. So how do we calculate the bare dominium in respect of that property? Where do we start? 
Um, we need to determine the fair value and then times that by 12%. Okay. And then from there, what do we do? Um, then from there, we need to determine the life expectancies of the donor and the specific period. Thank you. So we are going to go and look at the, we now need to determine the user fact and we only look at the the donee's life expectancy or the specific period. In this case, we don't have a specific period, so we're only going to look at the donee's um, life expectancy. So in this case, it will be 41 years old of uh, the 41 years of Janet as per table A and the 50 years life expectancy of the trust as per table B. And then, um, uh, is it okay if I just go on to the solution? Do you guys want me to um, go back to the table for you guys? Or can I just go and show you the solution? The solution. Okay, thanks, Bunted. All right, so we take our 40 million rand, which is the value of the commercial property, and then we'll multiply that by the 12% and we'll get the 4.2, uh, 4.8. So we know that Janet gets 50% and the trust also gets 50%. So each um, the of, of that um, user fact. So each person, we would take the 2.4 for them. Then we only look at the life expectancy of the donees. In this case, it's Janet and the trust. Her, on her next birthday, she'll be 41 years old. So the factor is the 8.16762. And then the, cal the calculated value would then be 19,602,288 um, rand. Then for the trust, we'll take um, the 2.4 multiplied by the 8.304 as per table B. Um, that is the that is the factor for the trust. Then we would then get an answer of nineteen million nine hundred and twenty nine six hundred and six hundred rand. Now, then um, we would then take our total user fract that we've determined, and we would less it from the value of the of the property, the fair market value of the property to get our bed dominium. So we would take the 40 million less the 19,000, 19,602,288 rand, less the 19,929,600 rand, and then would give us the bed dominium of 468,112. So is everyone comfortable with the bed dominium calculation? Then our uh, third required is for us to calculate the donations tax payable by Tandy, and that is for seven marks. So Tandy, let's go see what she donated. Mm, yeah, they told us that on the 1st of March, Tandy transferred her listed share portfolio valued at, 14, uh, at 15 million rand to the CT, subject to a loan of uh, 10 million rand, bearing interest at 5% per annum, the total income for the listed uh, share portfolio for the current year was the uh, 1.4 was 1.5 million in total. Okay, so let's start with just the transfer that she's made. How much of it is actually a donation? Is the full 15 million rand a donation? I think the donate the donation is the 15 million minus the 10 million. Yes. So it's the five million. Correct. So only five million was actually a donation. The rest was a, a loan. The 10 million was a loan. And then they tell us that um, the loan has an interest of 5% per annum. Let's go to the... Uh, the SARS. They tell us, assume the official rate, um, the official... SARS official rate was 9% per annum for the entire year of assessment. So she gave them a loan of 5% per annum, but SARS says the official rate is 9%. What, we, what do we then do with that? So the donation part of it is a, the, it's what 9% minus 5%. Yes. 
correct. So that portion again will then be um, the donation, the 4% that she's not um, leaving, um, what you might call it, interest on will then be um, exempt. Ah, not exempt, will be a donation, sorry. So there'll be donations tax on that portion. Okay, so let's go to the solution. Here we go. So she, we determined that the value of the share portfolio is the 15 million rand. And then um, the portion that's not subject to, uh, 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 to donations is the loan to the trust of 10 million rand. So the donation to the trust in relation to the, the shares is 5 million rand. Then we need to determine um, the interest that was donated to the trust in terms of section 7 cap C. We would then take the 10 million rand multiplied by the official rate of 9%. We would get 900,000 rand. Less the interest that was actually charged to the trust of 5% and that would give us 500,000 rand. So the interest that was donated to the trust was only 400,000 rand. So the total value of the donation was 5.4 million. Then less the exemption, the general exemption that she would qualify for in terms of section 56 uh, to be of 100,000 rand. Then the donations that's taxable for the year would then, or for her would then be 5.3 million. And then the donations tax that is payable on the 5.3 million was a million and 60,000 rand. Okay. All right. Um, then they tell us to calculate Jabu's taxable income from the trust. So now we need to see what the Jabu actually get from the trust. So we go to the trust deed. It tells us that Jabu receives 10% of the commercial property income. And then, um, so he only received the 10%, right, from the commercial property. Is that the only thing that he will be taxed on? If we look at the donation that he made to the trust, he donated that property, right? And then there was a condition that came about um, with, with um, Tommy receiving the 2% of the commercial property income. There was a condition that, um, he, this will only happen until he reaches the age of 18 years. So that means that we need to look, we need to go back to our section seven um, um, requirements and which specific um, section would then apply to this um, condition. Any guesses? Any takers? What does it mean that there's this, this condition? What needs to happen? I'm going to try. Yes, it's fine. So um, because Tommy is a minor, it's going to be um, it's going to be taxed in Jabu's hands. Okay. So so my assumption is that that two percent should come into Jabu's um, income tax. Okay, and which specific section are you using? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, I cannot reference that at the moment, but I'll get okay. back to you quickly. Yeah. All right, that's fine. So you are talking about section seven uh, two, where it says that if there's a um a donation made by a, a parent, um, and the minor is the one who benefits from it. A minor who's not mar married or divorced or widowed would then be taxed in the parent's hand. So in this case, it wouldn't apply because Jabu is not the parent of Tommy. He is the grandfather of um, Tommy. So section two, uh, seven two would then not apply to him. But good attempt. Noted. Thank you, Eliane. Uh, I think Deboho, you wanted to say something? I wanted to say, um... The donation. You muted yourself. Oh, sorry. No, it's fine. I'm saying that the donation tax won't be affected in the current year of assessment because uh, Tommy will only get the benefits of the 
only when he reaches 18. Okay. And he's not yet 18 in days, yeah, of assessment. Okay, I, I hear what you're talking about, Ne. But now the donation was not made to Tommy. The donation was made to the trust. Ne? And now we are, we are trying to determine the taxable income that is um um that that uh, that Tommy uh, not Tommy that Jabu needs to be taxed on from the trust. So remember when we did trusts, there was um specific rules that came about from section seven. Um, our anti-avoidance um, provisions, if we can call it that, um, where they said, if now you then don made a donation and you put a condition to um, that donation in that trust, then you then need to be the one who's taxed on any income that is remaining in the trust. So that's section seven, five, that tells us that if now, there is um, a portion that you, um, or there's something that you distributed to the trust, and then there is a condition that is applicable in the trust deed, then that amount that is um, still sitting in the trust will then be taxed in your hands. So in this case, Jabu donated the building um, to the trust, the commercial building to the trust, and then the trust deed then, or he himself, Jabu, stipulated that um, Tommy will only receive this 2% until he reaches the age of 18 years old. So that means now there is a condition in the trust deed. So we now need to go and tax Jabu on any portion of the commercial property income, um, the rental income that is still sitting in the trust at the end of the year of assessment. So um, in this instance, after they had um, determined who gets what in the trust or um, the commercial or the rental income um, that was distributed, there was 4 million rand that was still sitting in the trust. So this 4 million rand will need to be taxed in the hands of Jabu because he's the one who donated it to the trust and he made a condition um, on the rental income or the, he made a, a condition in the trust deed that Jab, uh, Tommy will only receive this 2% until he reaches the age of 18 years old. Okay. Are we together? Does it ring a bell? Yes. Okay, Thanks. awesome. All right, so let's look at our solution. Uh, here we are. So Jabu will then be taxed on the portion that he received. Um, so um, the, the, the income that was received from the trust was um, the rental income that was received um, from the trust was the 9 million multiplied by 50% because um, the user fract was donated to both Janet and the, um, the trust. So that means the fruits or the income that comes from that commercial property will then be divided, divided between Janet and the trust 50-50 and then, then, then distributed to the people. So in this case, 50% of the 9.9 9 million um, will then be, um, and then, okay, wait, we first take 50% that the trust receives, then multiply that by 10% because he was only entitled to 10% according to the trust deed. So 450,000 Rand will be included as part of his gross income. And this will be done in terms of the gross income definition. Then the undistributed um, commercial property income that is retained in the trust that was given to us um, of 4 million rand will then be taxed in his hand because we said that section 715 applies um, and because they said Tommy is only entitled to this rental income until he reaches the age of 18 years old. So then they ask us in E to calculate Tandy's taxable income from the CT. So let's see what Tandy received. Tandy receives 5% of the commercial property income and 10% of 
the components of the listed share portfolio. So how do we treat her, um, her income? Uh, the commercial property income, mm -hmm. the nine million, is it the nine million times the five percent? Yes. Yes. That's a hundred percent correct. And then, um, with regards to the five percent, they told us that they received um one point five um million rand from that uh, share portfolio. And then, because um, she's entitled to what, uh, 10%, right? So we would then take 10% of the interest, 10% of the REIT dividends, and 10% of the 900,000 Rand. So then what do we then do with that, um, that those incomes, the interest, the REIT dividends, the normal dividends, what do we do? See, yeah, I'm not sure if we subtract the exemptions before or we add them up, then times the times by 10%, then exempt. Yeah, I don't know what comes before or what, but okay. we must we must do the exemption somewhere. Okay. Uh Tepiso, I think you had your hand up. It went down so quickly, so I didn't see if it was you. It was Tepo. Oh, Tepo, okay. Tepo, sorry. Uh, I think we, I'm not sure, I just want to take a guess as well. Yes, it's fine. Uh, I think with the dividends, uh, since normal normal dividends are exempt from, in, from tax, uh, I think we will subtract that one and with the SA interest and we will subtract the the 30 is it 34500 from yes. it yes uh, yeah, i'm not really sure but i think that's how we should go okay awesome that's 100% correct so what sections are you using for those exemptions section 10 1 mm -hmm. i for interest Thank you. And for dividends, I think it's F. I'm not yet sure, okay. but I know it's 101. 101K. Oh. But I give you the 100% for the interest. And then for dividends, it's 101K, eh? Okay. So okay. The, 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 then the, the full exemption of 34,500 will then be applicable because she still also has the interest that she received from the loan that um, she gave to the trust. So we also need to take that into account when we are make, when we are doing the taxable income calculation for um, Tandy for the year. So this interest income that she, uh, or the interest um, of 5% that she charged to the trust will also then um, need to be included as part of her gross income. So let's go to the solution. Yeah, uh, we have our interest on the loan to the trust. Of 10, uh, we, so we calculate that by saying 10 million multiplied by the 5%, and that gives us 500,000 Rand. Um, then the distribution of the rental income, um, we take the 50% of the rental income that we received, and we take 5% from there, and we get 275,000 Rand. Then we have distribution from the listed share portfolio, the interest portion. We take 10% of the 200,000 Rand, and that gives us 20,000 Rand, less our interest exemption, um, and that gives us, uh, in terms of Section 10.1i, um, of 34,500, because she is older, she is 65 years and older. And then um, our REIT income is 10% of the 400,000 Rand, and that's uh, 40,000 Rand. There is no exemption for that REIT income. And then the SA company dividends of 10% of the 900,000 gives us 90,000 Rand. And we know that dividends is exempt in full in terms of section 10.1K. Um, and that gives us a total taxable income of 800,500 800 800, Rand. Okay. Okay. Calculate Tommy's taxable income in the CT. So Tommy is our minor. Let's go and see. So here is where we will apply um, section seven, uh, uh, section seven, 
uh, three, sorry, it's not two, it's three, session seven, three, where um, we, when the donations are made by his parent, who is Jeanette, so um, the, the donation that she made was the fixed deposit of one million to the CT, um, and uh, the income that was earned was the 60,000 rand from there. So whatever income Tommy gets from there, she will be the one who's taxed on that amount of money. So Tommy receives the 2% of the commercial property um, and he'll be taxed on that one because Jabu's not his um, parent, but his grandma, grandfather. And then um, he will receive 3% of the listed share portfolio that um, Tandy, his grandmother, also donated. So there again, he'll be taxed on that income in his own capacity. Then the 5% of the fixed deposit, he, uh, the mother will then be taxed on it in terms of section 7.3. Okay. So let's just look at the solution. It tells us here that um, he gets 3% of the um, interest of the 200,000 rand, and that's 6,000 rand. Then there's an exemption um, of 23,800 in terms of section 10.1i, um, and it's limited to the actual interest that he received, which was 6,000 rand. Then the REIT income, 3% of the 400,000 rand, um, which is 12,000 rand. And then um, the SA company dividends of 3% of the 900,000 rand, 27,000 rand. Um, and then the dividends in, ex, um, the dividends is exempt in, in terms of section 10.1k. And then uh, the fixed deposit, uh, section 7.3 applies because Tommy's a minor, so this amount will be taxed in the mother's hands. Um, I see that we left out something here, the income, the the, the rental income of 2%, so that, that will be the 900, no, the 9 million times 50% times the 2% will also be included as part of his gross income, and then um, he'll be taxed on that amount as well. With, with uh, I mean, with regards to the the rental income that he's going to receive, is it taxable in his hands or in the hands of Jawu? Since there's uh, a condition that will only receive those divid, uh, will only receive uh, the income when it turns eighteen. Is it taxable in his hands or in the hands of Jawu? It will be taxed in his hands. It's the portion that is left in the in the trust that will be still taxed. That will be taxed in um, Jabu's hands, not the portion that is vested to um, or distributed to the individual. Let's go. Yes, it'll be it will be taxed in the in it will be taxed in Tommy's hands, not in the um, in not in the donor's hands. No, I'm lying. I'm lying, Tepo. I'm lying. You're you're right. It will be taxed in in Jabu's hands, not in. Tommy's hands because it's vested to, it's deemed to have been received by um, uh, what you might call it by Jabu. So everything that has a condition will be taxed in the person who made the conditions hand, even though it was distributed to um, to what's his face to ja uh, to Tommy. So it would be taxed in in Jabu's hands and not in Tommy's hands. I need to include that here. Are you fine, Tepo? So, so to come back to when we calculated Jabu's um, taxable income, it should would have that been be a... Okay. Yes, you're correct. So the meme was actually incorrect. So it should have been also here as well. So the two percent should have also been here. I'll correct it and send it to you. Okay, awesome. Somebody else had their hand up? Is the question gone? It okay. was me, it's fine. Are you it fine? Was about, uh, yes, the distribution, Tommy, Trust, and Jabu. Okay, so awesome. it's covered, thanks. All right, so we can move on now from Trust and uh, Donations Tax 
everybody's happy, everybody's getting a distinction on this part. Am I the only one that would like you just to go through Jabu's one again? Okay, let's go through it again. If you don't mind, yeah. No, I don't mind. Okay, so let's do this again. So Jabu would have had his income from the 10% that he received from the commercial property. So it would be the 50% of the 9 million multiplied by 10%. Then again, he would receive the distribution of Tommy's portion of the 9 million uh, times 50% times 2% because that's what Tommy was entitled to because there is a condition in terms of section 75 uh, uh, then I will calculate the amount. Can let me let me do the mathematics. Two seconds times fifty percent, and then times two percent. So that's ninety thousand rand that should have been included as part of Jabu's income. And then again, there's the undistributed portion of the rental income because of the condition that is placed in the trust deed. Um, that undistributed portion will then be included as part of um, Jabu's income as well. So the, four, the full 4 million will also be part of his income. And then the total taxable income in Jabu's um, hands will then include um, Tommy's portion as well as the undistributed portion of the um, in the trust. Yeah. Are we happy, Leanne? Yeah. Are you happy? I am. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. So we are moving on to estate duty. So today and on Thursday, when we come together again, we'll also cover estate duty. So with estate duty, estate duty is a wealth tax as well. Um, what happens when we die, we also have to pay taxes because that's just how it goes. So with estate duty, when a person dies, you cease to be um, a taxpayer on the date of your death. So your year of assessment will run from the 1st of March to the date that um, the person passes away. So normal tax consequences will then still be applicable in terms of section of, of the Income Tax Act, sorry, and also of the eighth schedule, any CGT consequences that takes place because of um, you um, passing away will also then um, be applicable. Then your deceased estate then becomes a separate taxable person. And then this will then be um, administered by the executor. Um, and that person will then be responsible to make sure that all your tax affairs are in order and they will wind up that your estate or the deceased person's estate. And this will be done in terms of the Estate Duty Act. So with Estate Duty as well, we also have our um, format that we need to um, know um, when we have to do our calculation for Estate Duty. So first, first of all, we need to determine the value of the property in terms of section 3.2. Then um, you add all your value of your deemed property and that you would find in section 3.3 of the um, Estate Duty Act. Then that will give you your gross value of estate. Then you are allowed some deductions in terms of section 4. So you will deduct those and then you would get your net value of estate. Then you will get a section four cap A abatement that you can deduct from your value of the estate. And this amount is 3.5 million Rand per person. So um, this can be a bit more if you are um, married and then your spouse passes away before you do, then you have um, the opportunity to use up any portion of the abatement that is still available from your um, predeceased spouse um, estate. So if that 
if your spouse passes away and from the abatement of the 3.5, they only use, let's say, 500,000, then you will still have the 3 million available to for you to use um, when you pass away. So then that will then give you your dutable amount and then you would determine your estate duty at 20% up to the point that your um your dutable amount is 30 million rand anything in excess of the 30 million rand will be then taxed at 25% so if your if the dutable amount ex, is ex, is up to let's say it's 30 31 million rand Everything until 30 million rand will be taxed at 20%, and then the 1 million rand will then be taxed at 25%. Then you will have rebates that you can deduct. Uh, you'll you'll, you can deduct your transfer duty in terms of Section 16A, any foreign debt duties that were payable in terms of Section 16C, and then any uh, successive debt in terms of section 2.2. Then you will list uh, any estate duty that is being paid by your beneficiaries in terms of section 11. Um, then that will be the estate duty that is payable by the estate. Okay, so this format you need to know um, so that you can do your calculation of estate duty. Then, now we need to determine um, what is our property. Your property will be everything that the deceased person owned or had interest in worldwide. So this is for a South African resident. For estate duty, we're just looking at South African residents. We don't look at non-residents. Then um, what is excluded from the property? We exclude any benefits from your pension, pension preservation, Provident, Provident Preservation, and all retirement annuity funds. Um, how do we then value our properties? And this is where, this is the part that we need to know very well. And we determine our, value, our values of our assets using Section uh, 5 of the Estate Duty Act. So any assets that we sold, we would use the price that we would have gotten for that specific asset. If we haven't sold the assets um, or the assets were not sold um, as part of the um, winding up of the estate, um, then we would use the fair market value. Um, but then if we have a bona fide farming property, we will less 30% uh, um, from the fair market value if it's still being used for bona fide uh, farming um, activities. And then there are special rules. If you have unlisted private shares, then you need to use the fair market valuation and not the realization pri uh, price. So even if you sold those unlisted shares, you still use your fair market valuation. Then um, again, if we then have things like your fiduciary or user factory or other like interests, we then need to also calculate um, our user factories um, like the same way that we would have done it with donations and um, um, trusts. So here, the only difference is that we would um, identify the shorter of the life expectancy of the beneficiary. So we still use the next birthday and we use the uh, table A. And then we use, uh, if there's a specified period, we would use table B and we would always use the shorter of the two. And then if we are working out the bed dominium, we know that we, we use fair market value less the user fract of um, the the beneficiary okay so if there is books pictures uh statuary or other objects of art we would use the average net receipts derived from such items during the preceding three years prior to death if there was no income that's being generated from those assets then the annual value would be zero so uh okay so then they are specific um, 
provisos that are provided in Section 51B when it comes to calculating the fiduciary user factories or other like interests. And there we have um, the first proviso is um, in Section 51B, the paid dominium holder inherits the user fract and paid um, an uh, original the original owner when it was created. Then you would you reduce the value of the user fract with the cost of the bare dominium when when it was created, plus six percent um, per year compound interest um, to the date of the user factory death. So what that means is, if now I have the the bare dominium, the ownership of the of a property, for instance, and then the user fract is given to someone else, and then the person who has the user fract passes away, and I had to pay um, for that uh, bare dominium when when I got it in the first place. I had to pay, um, let's say, for instance, 5,000 Rand. Then when we now determine the, the user fract on the date of the person who passes away, the user fract holder, then I need to take that 5,000 Rand um, and multiply it by 6% compound, compound interest and um, to the date that I have the, or I inherit that user fract from the, the user fract holder. So if B passes away and he was the user fract holder and I paid 5,000 Rand two years ago, we would then have to determine my user fract less than 5,000 multiplied by 6% um, compounded um, yearly and then that would then be deducted from the new user fact that we have now determined. Okay, then the second proviso in section 51B, um, the bare dominium holder also inherits the user fact, then the value of the user fact must not be more than the va market value at the death of the user fact holder, less the bare dominium value at creation. So, we look at the we look at the date when the user fact holder died and the date that the um the the bare dominium was then given to me. So we need to make sure that the user fact that I now inherit as the bare dominium holder will not exceed the value of the user fact. Uh, will not exceed the market value um at the death of the user fact holder. Um less the bare dominium at the date that I received my bare dominium. Then um, the third proviso in section uh, 51B, um, if we cannot ascertain who the beneficiary is, then the life expectancy that we use will be for 50 years. So let's say um, the will says to an unborn child, um, or unborn is, then we would use the life expectancy of 50 years. Okay. All right, yo. Then our next thing is we also have to calculate the right of any annuities that are charged against property. So we would take the annual amount multiplied by the life expectancy of the person who received the benefit or the shorter of the uh, shorter period. Um, if the right of use to an annuity is not charged against a specific period, uh, uh, against the property, then the annual amount will be multiplied by the life expectancy of the person who received the benefit or a shorter period. So the annual amount will be the annuity amount that that person, um, that the person would have um, um, received um, in that specific period. Okay. Then we also have our deemed property. Um, this is my, made up of domestic policies of the life um, of the deceased. Um, and then there are three exemptions there. So if the, the policy is given to the, the child or the wife, then it's not going to be um, included as part of um, the it will be then exempt. Um, if there's a policy that was paid by somebody else, um, on your life, then it would then also be exempt. And then the third one, um, if, let, um, I can't remember the third one right now, but there's a third one. It says that if, 
hold on. Here is the exemption. Then the third one is where the commissioner is satisfied that the policy was not taken out by or at the instruction of the deceased person. No premiums were borne or paid by the deceased person and no amount in terms of the policy is payable to the estate of the deceased person and no amount in terms of the policy is payable to or to be used for the benefit of any relative dependent of that deceased person or any family or company of the deceased person. So it's also the same thing as the second one. Um, so the only difference is it's 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 not going to come into the estate of the, the deceased person. OK, then um, we also have benefits payable by funds in consequence of membership or past membership in terms of Section 3 to be cap A um, exemption. Um, we also exempt uh, uh, also exempt donations would also be part of our deemed property. So any donations that you've made in contemplation of death or um, the benefit only passes once you um, pass away as the donor, then that would also be deemed to be part of your property. Um, because remember, we said that we wouldn't pay donations tax on such donations because that stuff would then be forming part of your um, property for estate duty purposes. So that's why it's going, it's exempt for donations tax purposes, but for uh, estate duty, we will then um, pay the, the tax for um, estate duty instead. Then any accrual claims against the surviving spouse will also form part of your deemed property. Any property that um, the deceased was immediately prior to his death um, co um, competent to dispose of for his or her own benefit or for the benefit of the estate. So if you see that you are unwell and you decide that, OK, I'm going to start selling off my um, assets so that by the time I actually die, the assets are not in my prop in my estate anymore. So that will also be deemed to be still your property as well. OK, then we also need to note that policies or these are exemptions policies payable to the surviving spouse or child are not exempt uh, when such payment was agreed on in the pre or anti nuptial contract. So that also needs to be taken into account. So it will only be exempt if it's not um, agreed upon in a pre or anti nuptial contract. However, all accruals or or all property that's left to a sub, um, surviving spouse are deductible in terms of section 4Q. Uh, therefore, a policy that accrues to the surviving spouse will never be taxed. So policies accruing to the children may still be taxed. OK. Uh, then after our deemed uh, property, then we have our less uh, deductions. So the deductions that you can um, claim against your estate are your funeral, tombstone, deathbed, ex uh, deathbed expenses, any debts that you owed in South Africa, cost of administration and liquidation. So that would be your executor's um, expenses. And those expenses will not be, um, you will not need to determine yourself, but that will be in, provided to you during the exams or during your tests. Um, then also any expenses that were incurred to comply with the requirements of the master or um, the commissioner of SARS. Um, anything that is relating to your, your legal matters, you can claim. Um, any foreign property and the conditions there is that the property must be outside of the Republic and you acquired this property before you became a resident of South Africa um, or the property was acquired during your residency in SA, but you received it by way of donation from a non-resident or you inherited it from someone who is not a resident, or property that you acquired out of proceeds of the deductible property, so any of the two above. So if you had sold um, a property that's outside that you acquired before, or property that you acquired during your residency by way of donation from a non-resident or inherited from a non-resident, that proceeds that you get from selling those properties, then you can um, then that those will also then be um, 
um, seen as um, foreign property, so you can then deduct it from your estate duty. Um, foreign debts, this will be your foreign uh, debts less the value of any assets outside of SA that are not included in the estate, then whatever is left over, you can still set off against your um, foreign assets um, that are included in your estate. Then Section 4G tells you that any limited interest received as a donation. So for instance, if you get a user fract um, that was donated to you, and then at the time of your death, then it reverts back to the donor, then that would also be deducted from your estate. Then any bequests to certain charitable uh, bodies will also then be um, allowed as a deduction. Improvements that were made to inherited property by beneficiaries. So what that means, if now I uh, make uh, improvements to my uncle's house, and then he passes away, um, those improvements that I made will then be deducted from the uh, estate of the person who passed away. Uh, any uh, same thing, any uh, enhancements in the value of a fiduciary user fact in the property through improvements by beneficiaries, uh, accruals by a surviving spouse, accrual claims, sorry, by a surviving spouse that will also then be um, deductible from your estate. Any books, pictures, statuary, and other works of art that you have lent to the republic, uh, to the government of the republic, be it a local, national, um, local, provincial, or national government, um, for a period of at least thirty years, um, then that you can also deduct um, from your estate. Then any policies proceeds um, that were taken into account in the valuation of shares. And then section 4Q, any amounts that are accruing to your surviving spouse. Those will then be part of your deductions. Then you have your section 4A abatements, which we've already discussed or touched on that each person gets an amount of 3.5 million that you can deduct from your net value of your estate. And then if you're married, you can then take um, the, the abatement that's still available from your spouse's um, um, estate. So, or abatement rather. So if they only used 1.5 million, then you still have an abatement of 2 million that's still available for you when you die that you can set off against your net value of the estate. Okay, so those are the basics that you need to know. Um, there's still a lot more to it that you would have to know. So you guys still need to go back and study and make sure that you have all the information that you need in preparation for your exams. Okay, so now we're going to do an example of calculating a user fract in uh, someone's estate. So with this one, this is where we're going to apply the provisos that we've just went through. So let's look at the information. It tells us when A, the holder of a user fract of a prop over a property died, B, a male of 38 years old and the bare dominium holder of the same property received the full ownership of the property. So here we will then apply provisos um, B. So this one, we, uh, yeah, the second proviso not B. The second proviso will then be applicable here because we see that um, when A, the holder of the user fact passed away, then B then received the, the full ownership of the property. So they tell us that the property was worth 1.750,000 uh, 1, Rand at the time of A's death. So the property was originally left to B subject to a lifelong user fract in favor of A, a male aged 82 years old and two months when F died. So this is when um, the user fract and the bed dominion was then created. And this happened two years ago. So we need to then, this is in, important information because um, if there was any annuity that had to be paid or if there was any price that needed to be paid, sorry, then we would then capitalize it at 6% um, and then reduce our user fact by that amount in terms of the first proviso. 
So then they tell us in terms of F's will, B pay the bequest price of 10,000 Rand to F's widow. So that is the, the amount that we would use in order to determine the user fract. So the value of the property was 1.5 million at the time of F's death. Okay, so where do we start? When we are calculating the user fract in A's estate. Uh, I think we start by calculating the annual value of the property. And which one, of, which value are we going to be using? Are we using the 1.750 or are we using the 1.5? 1.750. Correct. And then from there, what do we then do? Um, I think we need to find the lesser a life expectancy of the beneficiary. So our beneficiary in this case is is a B, ne? and B's life expect uh, not life expectancy. B is thirty eight years old at the time of A's death. So we go to our table and we look. They didn't give us a, a, another period, so we know we would just look at B's life expectancy. So uh, his next at his next birthday, his life expectancy would be thirty point four one because he's a male, and then uh, using the factor, we know that we would use the factor in this line, which would be uh, the eight comma zero six seven eight one. So that will be the factor that we use, right? That's our first part. Uh, is the duty okay? There we go. So then now we would have used, we would do the normal calculation of the user fract. There we go. So we would take the 1.750, multiply by 12%, and we would determine the present value per uh, of one rand per year over B's life. So the factor for that one would be the 8,06781. And we multiply that, we capitalize our annual value, we take the 210,000 multiplied by the 8,067.81. And that would give us the 1,694,240 Rand. Then from there, we have provisos, right? So yes, this is the user fract amount that we've now calculated. But the provisos say to us, we need to limit the actual user fract that will be applicable um, in A's uh, estate, because um, now that user effect reverts to, or it's being inherited by um, the owner of the bed dominion. So now we need to look at proviso one, right? Proviso one tells us that, let's go back here to the information. Proviso one tells us that if the bed dominium holder is the one who in inherits the user fract and they paid an original amount to the owner when it was created, or they had to pay an, a, an amount to the owner, then we have to reduce the user fract amount by the uh, by the cost that they had to pay plus 6% per year compounded in annually um, till the date of the user fract uh, holder state name. So in our instance here, we have, B had to pay 10,000 Rand to F's widow, and this was two years ago, right? So we need to take the 10,000 Rand multiplied by the 6% per year, but compounded annually. So when we do our calculation, we need to make sure that we compound the interest per annum for the two years. So for us to calculate it, we would take the 10,000 Rand, the period was two years, um, and then we would take the 10,000 multiplied by 1.06 to the power of two because it's compounded annually and we had it for the two years, and that would give us an amount of 11,236 Rand. So the, the limit of the user fract in Proviso 1 would then be the 1.694, 240 
minus the 11,236 that we calculated. Um, so we calculated that one there already, and then this is the 11,000 that we calculated here. So we limit the user fract value for A's estate by um, 1,683,000 1, rand, and uh, uh, 1, 1, 1,683,004 rand. Okay. But then we don't stop there because um, we have the second proviso that says that if um, we if if the the bed aluminium holder inherits that um, the the user fract, then we need to limit again. We need to still limit the user fract of the user fract holder, um, and then we do that by taking the value of the user fract, um, we take the market value at the at the time of the death of A, less the bed dominium value at the creation. So at the time of F's death, and then we then determine what is our second limit. So now we need to go and calculate what is the user fract at the time of death of F, right? So we would take the 1.5 million multiplied by 12% and we would use A's uh, factor because he was the benef the benefit the, the benefactor or the beneficiary of the of that um, user fract. And we would take that and multiply it by the factor. At the time, he would have been 82 years old at the time, right? When, when he died, when F died. So we would go to our table. So they told us that at the time of F's death, at the time of F's death, he was 82. So the next birthday, he would then be 83. So we would go, he is a male. And uh, let's just draw a line there so we can see. So the amount or the factor would then be the 3,652. Seven six that we would use as the factor for A um, at the time of F's death, so that we can calculate the user fract. Going back to our, here we go. So we would use the one hundred and eighty thousand that is the twelve percent of the one point five million multiplied by the three comma six five two seven six. And that would give us 657,497 rand. Okay. So they told us that for us to, to determine the limit of the user fract that should be in A's uh, estate, we never we want to make sure that the the value of the bed dominium at, at um F's death um would then be the 1.5 million less that user fract that we determined, which is the 657,497 rand. And that gives us the bed dominion value of 842,503 rand. So the value of the user fract that we must limit now would be our market value at the time of A's death, which is the 1.750 less the Bay Dominion's user fract at the time of F's um, death, um, and that would give us the 907,497 rand. So of the two provisos, we need to look at the smaller amount uh, of the two, and then that will then be the user fract amount that we should apply at A's death. So at this point, the, the user fract according to the second proviso will then be the portion or the user fract that we need to use in A's state. Okay. And this would have counted for, I think it was 12 marks. This is your time to ask questions unless you are comfortable and you are sure of yourselves. Okay, thank you. It's actually two new, sir. That is no mm -hmm. problem. Okay, thank um, you. I wanted to find out if it's it's uh, uh, compulsory to do the both um, 
uh, provisor or you have to do, there's a there's a point where you you know you have to do one or you on, you have always have to do the both limitation okay so you would look at the information that you have available to you so if they hadn't said that um, at the time of if death um, what's his name B had to pay for the bed dominium then you wouldn't have had to do the first proviso because you wouldn't have paid anything. But had had it been that, um, but in this instance, sorry, in this instance, he had to pay the 10,000 rand to F's widow. So you you would have to do the, the first proviso. But if there is no um, amount that was paid, there was no bequest price that had to be paid, then you wouldn't have to do for the first proviso. Okay, so you would have... Uh... Go straight to the second proviso. Yes. That okay, you would thank you. Do. Yes, you would have to do the second proviso because it's the one that's telling you that you cannot have a user flag that's higher than the um, the market value less the bed dominium at the time of the creation of the bed dominium. Okay. Um, do you know? Yes. In this question, was it necessary for us to do the first proviso? Because, yes. um, okay. Yes, continue. Uh, because the answer that we took was from the second proviso. So I'm trying to, to understand how, how the first proviso and second proviso are, are dependent on each other. Because okay. the question is asking for the um, what's this the user fract of A's estate. Mm -hmm. So, and, so the reason why we do the first one is because we need to determine which one of the two is actually the smaller amount. If now you skipped the first proviso, how were you going to know that really the second proviso was the smaller amount? So you need to show that you did take into consideration the first proviso and you did do the steps for the first proviso so that you can determine uh, which one of the two is actually going to be the smaller amount. Maybe in a different question, they could have said that the amount of consideration was uh, 200,000 rand, for instance. Then maybe the answer would have been more here than what, I mean, it would have been smaller here than um, it would have been in the second proviso. If our, our values were different, let's say um, it ended up being that the first proviso was a smaller amount. So you do need to do both first proviso and second proviso, depending on the information that they give you. If it is necessary to do the first proviso, you will know if there was a, an amount that the, the bed dominium holder um, had to pay to um, the estate of F or um, to their widow. Okay. So if the question was asking for um, these uh, user fraud, mm -hmm. we still calculate the second proviso. If they were asking for B's user fraud, But remember, the, the 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 question wouldn't have asked you for B's user fract because we want to determine how much of the user fract is actually going to be included as part of A's estate. But if you were just calculating if uh, how much um, is going to be received in B, then you wouldn't have had to do the sec You wouldn't have to do the provisos because. Um, the provisos are applicable if the person who had the user fact passes away and the, the person who has the Bay Dominium is now uh, um, acquiring that user fact. So oh. we are limiting the amount that we're going to include as part of A's user fact because it, it wouldn't be fair to now tax him on the full amount. So we have our second question. They tell us that 
we need to calculate the estate duty payable in this estate, and we need to round off our answers to the nearest rand. Okay, so now you guys are going to do all the talking. Oops, I don't know what I did there. And then we're going to start. They tell us John Rupert died in Bloemfontein on the 31st of uh, October 2023. He is survived by his wife, Petronella, to whom he was married out of community of property and his major two daughters, Rosemary and Marinda. The executor in John's estate found the following assets, liabilities, interest in the estate. The first one, a residence in Bloemfontein valued at 1,250,000 rand. What would this be? Where would we put this? Looking at our uh, our structure of calculating estate duty, where would the residence fall under? It's one of the assets. Yes, so it's one of the properties there. Is it a deemed property or is it just a property? It's property. Okay, awesome. So this would be included in terms of section 3.2 as um, part of the, the properties there. And then they tell us that we have furniture and effects valued at 300,000 Rand. Um, where would we take that? It's also property. And then, uh, okay, correct. And then they tell us that we have proceeds of a policy, um, policy A on John's life collected by the executor of 257,400 Rand. Um, the premiums plus 6% interest on this policy amounted to uh, 30,000 Rand. Where does this go? Um, I think this is deemed property. Okay. Who was that? Charlotte. Okay. Sorry, Charlotte. Yes, you're correct. So this would be part of your deemed property now because we said that any uh, policies that a person receives would also form part of their um, deemed um uh, deemed, uh, what you might call it, uh, deemed properties, yeah? in terms of section 3.3. So then they tell us that um, they were proceeds of a policy B on John's life paid directly to Petronella Rupert in terms of a properly registered anti-natural contract. Uh, the premiums plus 6% on this policy amounted to 20,000 Rand. Um, John paid the premiums on policies A and B. How would we treat this one? Yes, Mianka. Um, sorry, ma'am. I just have a question. I'm a little bit lost. What's okay. the difference between property and deemed property? Okay. Well, let's go back up. So our property is anything that the person owns, and then there are specific things that um, in the Act, in the State Duty Act, in Section 3.3, that are defined as being your deemed properties. So specifically, it includes your domestic policies of on the life of the deceased, and that's in terms of Section 3.3a, and there are specific exemptions that are mentioned um, that would not form part of your, your policies, and those are the things that um, were... Uh, sorry, now my brain is gone. Sorry. Um, where the proceeds were payable to the surviving spouse or child of the deceased under a duly registered anti-nuptial or post-nuptial contract, um, any policies that were being paid uh, or payable to a person who at the time of the deceased um, death was a partner of the deceased or a co-shareholder uh, in a company, or a co-member in a close cooperation with the deceased person, or um, any other um, 
uh, policies that the commissioner is satisfied that the person did not pay the policy premiums or um, they were not born, they were not born or it was not taken out by that person who died um, and that amount was not actually paid into the, the, the deceased person's estate. So those policies would then be exempt. But um, the, in general, your domestic policies are seen as being part of your deemed properties. Um, any ex, um, exempt donations, any donations that you made when you when you found out that you're dying or in contemplation of your death, you those donations that you made would then also be seen as part of your um, deemed property. Any accruals that you can claim from your surviving spouse that will also be part of your deemed uh, properties. Any uh, property that the deceased could have sold uh, or disposed of or um, um, just before they died, um, that would also be seen as part of your deemed um, property. And any uh, funds that were um, benefits that you were payable in consequence of a membership or past membership. So these are specifically seen as deemed um, property in terms of section 33, but anything else that you own, it will be your property in terms of section um, 32. Okay, thank you yeah. so much. So it's Lisa. just set. It just it's just set out in your act. Um, they 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 classify them separately between your deemed and your property property. I see. Okay, thank you, ma'am. I just have one more question. So yes. let's. For example, you own a building. Okay, mm -hmm. so then I, I see you did mention something about contemplation of debt. So let's say you own a building and um, you know that you have a terminal disease and you're going to like pass away next year. And then you say, okay, I am um, giving this building to my son. Mm -hmm. Would that then be deemed property? Yes, that will okay. still be. So the condition is you're giving it to your son, but he will have it if you die. Or when you die. So that will then be seen as part of your deemed property because you wouldn't have paid donations tax on that um on that donation that you made to your son. So um it will then still form part of your property so that it we will still be able to tax you for estate duty purposes. Okay, thank you so much. I understand. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. So going back to our question, uh, okay, yeah, here we go. So the proceeds of a po of policy B on John's life paid directly to Petronella Rupert in terms of a properly registered anti-nuptial contract of 160,000 rand. How would we then treat um, these um, this policy? Uh, are we on number four now? Yes, we are on number four now. It is also deemed deemed property. Okay. Remember, we said there are exemptions uh, to the deemed yes, uh, yes to the policies, ne? So the, the 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 exemption says when the proceeds are payable to the surviving spouse or child of this deceased person under a duly registered anti-nuptial or post-nuptial contract, then that, that policy will then be exempt from um from the from being part of your um, your deemed property or from your property. So we wouldn't include this one because it would be exempt. Okay. But you would still list it under your deemed property, but you would just mention that this one is exempt and you would not um, have an amount next to it. Then they tell us that John was the recipient of an, an, an annuity of 10,000 rand per annum paid to him from the profits of a business left to his brother Mark by their late father. These payments were to seize upon John's death, the annuity was created in uh, in their father's will. 
how do we then calculate um, this? How do we um, calculate the annuity that needs to be included as part of um, John's property? There's something that I'm, I keep losing. I think I understand, but I keep losing in my mind. Okay. Can you please explain the, the donations? Like when you donate something in contemplation of death, mm -hmm. uh, it's exempt on the one side and then text on the other side for estate duty. Please explain that. Okay. So what we are saying is if you are making a donation with the condition that you're going to die, ne? that's the condition. If you're contemplating that you're going to die and you make a donation, you start saying, okay, I know I'm dying next week. My doctor said I have a very serious sickness and I'm going to die next week. I start giving away all my stuff. All those things that you are donating, you won't have to pay donations tax on because we said in donations tax that these things are exempt in terms of section 56. I can't remember the specific paragraph now, but they are exempt. But then when it comes to estate duty, we will deem that to still be part of your property. Yes, you donated it before you died um, in contemplation of your death, but we are still going to view that those assets that you've donated as part of your property at the time of death. And then those things will be deemed to be in your property and we will tax you for estate duty purposes. You won't pay donations tax, but you will pay uh, estate duty on those assets. Okay. Yeah. So you are saying, as the donor, I'm not going to pay donations tax. Is that the, the donee will also not pay donations tax on that? Yes, because it oh. will be exempt. Oh, okay. And then mm. it will be taxed later on when I pass on. Yes. 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 So it will be taxed in the state of the donor when he passes away or when he dies. Yeah. Okay. So let's go back to the annuity. Ne? So we said that if a person receives an, an annuity, we will, um, that is charged against a uh, property or that is not charged against the property, um, we will then take the annual amount which is the annuity amount, the 10,000 Rand, multiplied by the life expectancy of the person who received the benefit or the shorter. So in this case, uh, the let's go back here. It tells us that uh, John was the one who received the annuity for um, 10,000 Rand per month, and it was paid to him from the profits that were received uh, from the business that, left, that was left to Mark. So when these these payments will stop uh, when he dies, and then um, it was created in their father's will. So now all those profits that Mark will receive will now be going to him in full. So they won't be an annuity anymore. So the person who benefits from that annuity now will be Mark because it will be now part of his business income for the year. Does that make sense? So we will look at the life expectancy of Mark because he's the one who's going to be receiving that annuity because it will be absorbed into the business profits. Uh, no, Dinao, yes. can you go back to the previous slide when you say annuity when it has and it doesn't have? Yo. Okay. <laughs> okay, let's go back. So when we are determining the value of an annuity, uh, now let's see, here we go. So if the right of an annuity is charged against a property, we would use the annual amount times the life expectancy of the person who received the benefit. The calculation is the same. There's no difference, it's the same calculation. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so it just, they want you to know that there'll be, in both instances, you would still have to calculate the the right to that annuity in both instances. So in this case, Mark will be the person who benefits from that annuity after John dies. So we will then determine 
what is max age? In this case, uh, mark will be, let's calculate again. Uh, he will be, you'll be 55, if I'm not mistaken. He'll be 55 now. So on his next birthday, he'll be 56. We will go back to table A and we would get the factor to be 7, 14414, and then that would give us the annuity um, charged on the property of 71,441. So the property being the business. Okay. Okay. Then there was a fixed deposit with a bank, and in there there was 120,000 rand. Uh, we would also include that as part of his property. Then they tell us that he made this investment uh, when his father died utilizing the 120,000 rand of proceeds of an insurance policy that he had taken out on the life of his father in 2007. So we would just include the 120,000 rand as part of our property. Then they tell us that there are units in a super growth fund valued at 5 million 250,000 Rand. These shares will then, or that value of the shares will then be included as part of our um, property um, at the amount that it's being valued at. And remember we said, uh, if there are shares that are not listed, we would always use the value amount and never the price that the person would have um, sold the assets for. Then they tell us that there was no, um, um, there were no liabilities except for the master's fees of 7,000 Rand and the executor's remuneration of 251,174 Rand. So then we need to um, deduct this 7,000 Rand from the um, uh, gross value of the estate as well as the 251,000 174 rand in terms of section 74a uh, uh, i think it was a let me just make sure no that's not a it's in terms of section 4c sorry so in terms of section 74c we would then deduct these two amounts then they tell us that John's will also contains the following provisions. There is an amount of 10,000 rand that was bequeathed to a registered charitable organization that will also be deducted in terms of section 4H. Then there was, uh, uh, then they said that there was the residence, the furniture and the effects were um, bequeathed to the surviving spouse. So the um, amount of one, 1,250,000 rand plus the 300,000 rand would then be given to his spouse. So section 4Q would then be applicable to those things. And then we would also deduct that from the uh, gross value of the estate. And then that would give us our net estate amount. So let's go to the uh, solution. So we included our uh, residence, the furniture, the annuity that was charged on the on the business. Um, we said that we would use Mark's age, which would be 56 on his next birthday, and we would get 71,441 Rand. The fixed deposit of 120,000 Rand, the units from the, uh, the, the, sh the shares in the super growth fund, we would use the valuation amount of uh, 5,250,000 Rand. Then we would add our deemed property, which is our policies. We said the policy A would be included as part of our property, but policy B was exempt, so we would have a null amount there. That gave us the gross value of the estate to be 7,247,841 rand. Allowable deductions in terms of section four, uh, was the charity bequest of 10,000 Rand, the master's fees in terms of section 4C of 7,000 Rand, executor's remuneration uh, of 251,174 Rand, 
the bequest to the surviving spouse would also be deducted in terms of section S, uh, section 4Q, um, and that was for the house and the furniture, and that was 1.5 million that we are going to we're going to deduct. And then the net value of the estate was uh, 5 million four hundred and twenty nine thousand six hundred and sixty six sixty seven rand. Then we have our section four cap A abatement of three point five million, uh, which we would deduct against the net value of the estate. So our dutable amount would then be one million nine hundred and twenty nine thousand six hundred and sixty seven. Multiply that by our um, our estate duty rate of 20%, that would give us 385,933 rand. Then they tell us that we need to determine who is liable for um, payment of the estate duty. So if there's any estate duty that is um, payable on the, um, um, that, that is paid by the beneficiary. In this case, it would be on the annuity. So we would need to work out the, the, um, the portion that of the, of the net value of the estate, which would be the 71,441 over the total, um, net value of the estate. Multiply that by the portion of the, um, estate duty that is payable and we would deduct that from that as a rebate and that would give us our total uh, estate duty payable by the estate of 380,855 rand. So the, the estate duty for the annuity would then be paid by Mark. Yeah. I do know. Hi, hi. Uh, the exemption for policy B, which section is this? Or is it one of the three situations where mm. the amount is not included as deemed property? Correct. It's, it's the three situations. It's the three exemptions that oh, are there. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Thank you. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen. Okay, Bianca. Oh, hi, ma'am. I just want to say thank you so much for the class. You made everything so much more easier to understand. I think now I just need to do more practice questions okay. all of this work. Okay. Thank you, Mianka. You're giving me some hope. <laughs> thank you. You're welcome. All right. Bye, everyone. Bye, guys. Keep well. Keep well and take care.